a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Well, today is International Women's Day and while all sorts of issues compete for attention in Australia, honouring women and pointing out inequalities, let's get a focus on one set of women in the nation of India. And I've been doing some updates now over a number of years on the Jogini women and girls in India. These women are subject to ritualised abuse, caught in a generational temple prostitution. Even though it's now outlawed, the practice continues in thousands of villages. So perhaps a progress update today with Kate from Dignity Freedom Network. Kate, a special welcome along to 2020. Thanks so much, Neil, and great to be talking about this on a day like today. Kate, you're not long back from India. Uh, I wonder if we can start perhaps a contrast between Australian women and some of the legacy that Joe Guinea women in India have had to endure. Well, this practice, Neil, as I've mentioned before on the show, has taken place for around 2,000 years where women and girls are trapped in this most horrific form of trafficking and it's just something beyond our imaginations and you know sometimes people say to me I've, it's terrible seeing these stories on BBC or some other news platform and I say no it's wonderful seeing these stories out there because if they're happening we need to know about them and we need to know about them so we can do something about them and so one of the things we do, especially around International Women's Day, is use it as a platform to tell the story. And from Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, just being a voice for these women and girls who have no voice. So very different to Australia where women do have a voice. And of course, we can all do better, but it's a very stark difference. The population in India is huge. And even though the practice of recruiting these young girls for a temple prostitution has now been outlawed. Uh, The practice is continuing even in thousands of villages. Uh, Give us an update on how things look as we think about this today. Well, you're right, Neil. It happens across the country, but where we've been working, we're actually seeing the practice come to an end. So when we were there recently, one of our team members was talking to a couple of the women who have come out of the practice, and he said to them, So tell me, how many dedications have you been able to stop in the last uh, six months? And they said to him, almost looking at him like he was a bit stupid, and said, well, none. I mean, this is why we're doing what we're doing. We are raising awareness. We're advocating. We're actually seeing no dedications happening in our village. So we've been rescued. We don't want this to happen to other little women and girls, to other little girls. And so we're here. And while we're here, there's a line in the sand and there will be no other dedications. So... We're just seeing the villages that we're working in. This practice is coming to an end, which is absolutely remarkable. So it's a different religious atmosphere to what we experience here in Australia. I wonder, Kate, for those who are not so familiar, uh, how do girls find their way into this sort of exploitation? And uh, give us a hint here as to how you can get them free from it. Okay, so little girls are often dedicated because something bad has happened in the family or the family is in poverty and it would be their belief that dedicating their daughters would pacify the gods and bring good luck or favour to their families. And so this is what they're doing and this is why they're doing it. And uh, again, just a lot of poverty is a driver of this. So one of the areas that we address is why people are dedicating their daughters and if it's a reason of poverty, poor health, then we bring uh, help alongside them. We connect them with community health workers. We connect them with economic programs. And we just help the families move into a healthier economic situation or health situation to take away that driver. And then explaining to them that actually the practice is illegal, that the government has made it illegal, helping them to understand the importance of that and then providing them with alternatives. And it's even uncomfortable talking about it, isn't it? But uh, we're so unfamiliar in our culture with the thought of a temple prostitution. 
uh, these girls used and abused within communities. And so in order to help them be freed from that, you've got to be able to find a viable way to help them to escape or help them to grow out of the poverty that they're in that moves them into this temple prostitution. How do you do that, Kate? Well, most of our workers who are working in this space, many of them are women who have come out of the practice themselves. So they are absolutely passionate about stopping other little girls going into this practice. So we have a whole structure around a grassroots-led, nationally-led program where there's a whole tier of people who work together to bring the practice to an end. And we do it village by village. We don't do it en masse just saying, here's, here's an issue, let's just target the whole thing. Uh, we move ahead intentionally with women who are passionate, who have come out of the practice, and they're the ones advocating in their own village. They have community health workers around them, and then they have social workers. And we work with the police, we work with the village leaders, helping them to understand that the practice is illegal and that they need to support these women and girls. And as we're moving into these villages and, and working there over the years, we're gaining the respect of the authorities. And so it's very much working hand in hand with the authorities to end the practice. Now, I know you're working in a lot of village settings uh, across sections of India. Uh, how can you uh, just let us know how things are growing uh, because when I've spoken to you about this before, I've been absolutely astounded at the size and influence that your organisation, DFN, Dignity Freedom Network, has. Uh, give us an idea of how things are looking now. Well, Melbourne University did a study to ascertain how widespread the practice was. And because of their study, we can see it as, as you know an external study that we can uh, use the information that they've gathered. So it's around 3,000 villages where this particular practice happens. Certainly similar practices happen in other parts of the country as well, but we're just targeting a very, very specific geographical area because we feel like that's containable and we can address that. And once we have, we can then move into other geographical areas. So at the moment, Neil, we've expanded uh, the work into around 300 villages, and this year we're hoping to expand into another 20 or 30 so that we can see the practice end and, you know, more, more little girls protected and more women finding freedom and hope. And when you go into a village, uh, there's all sorts of needs, no doubt, uh, because if you've been trapped in ritualised abuse, a temple prostitution, uh, health care is one of your priorities. How does all that work, Kate? Mm -hmm. So it all comes down to the capacity on the ground. So we have around 160 community health workers and so each of those oversees a couple of villages and they support each other and they also support the women. They also focus on mental health checks as well because of course that's a huge issue too. Uh, of course there's prayer counselling that goes alongside it too but then as we're working with these women as we're getting HIV and AIDS testers we're helping these women move into physical health and mental health they also need to move into economic and social health. So connecting them in self-help groups where these women are actually looking out for each other and supporting each other is a huge breakthrough in their lives. For many of them, they've been ostracised in their own community and they haven't been able to gather with other women. So even helping them socially is huge. And then, as I said, the economic empowerment side. So skills training where we're teaching them tailoring skills or setting them up with small markets where they can provide for their own families. So they can actually have the dignity of earned success themselves. Some of them already had some level of education. And one of the initiatives that I was really excited about when I was across recently was to see a whole group of them being trained as paramedics. So they'll go back into their village, not as a fully fledged community health worker, but as somebody who is equipped in healthcare, like the first port of call and actually being able to help their own village and just having that dignity of people coming to them for help. It's um, quite remarkable to see the difference that this makes in their lives. Well, it's International Women's Day. Uh, wonder what you might be thinking, women listening to our conversation, uh, or even people who are in some level of leadership, either in a church or a parachurch or some sort of a home group even, how they might actually support the good work you do. Oh, thanks, Neil. So in March each year, because of International Women's Day, we have a whole campaign built around it. So it costs us $250 to support one of our village workers in a village 
for an entire year. So people can donate online. But the other thing that we really love is when people organise some kind of an event throughout March. So some people do clothes swaps, some people do bake sales, just whatever it is that interests people. And that way they can gather together a group of women and they can also share the story so that together, as I said, you know, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9, being a voice for those who have no voice. We have a toolkit, we have all sorts of resources, we have a whole Facebook campaign around this. So people can get together and just get online, organise some fun, fabulous event together, help share the word, help share the news and help draw other people along as well. Well, Dignity Freedom Network is a Christian organisation and uh, you are interested in all of those different elements that go along with Christian mission. Uh, But for listeners to connect today with Dignity Freedom Network and uh, what a day to make a connection, International Women's Day, dfn.org.au, dfn.org.au. And, of course, Kate is with Dignity Freedom Network. She leads the Australian operation here. Kate, thank you so much for updating us on these issues. And uh, no doubt there'll be lots of listeners too might want to keep you in their prayers as you continue this good work you do. Uh, Kate, thanks for joining us today on 2020. Thanks so much, Neil. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.